Hello, everybody, and welcome to the first of several personal finance presentations on how to save, invest, and uh, manage your money. My name is Joel Corey. I'm an associate professor of teaching and economics at the University of California, Riverside. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the keys to saving, investing, and become wealthy over time uh, with this particular presentation. Unfortunately, I don't have any get rich uh, quick schemes for you, at least none that are effective. Very few people do. But what I can do is give you some steps to take so that you can become wealthy over time so that by the time you retire, you can retire a millionaire and really accomplish your personal and professional goals. First thing is that you're going to want three different types of savings or investment accounts because you're going to be saving for three very different things. Right? So the first thing you want is an emergency fund in case something goes wrong. You want to have the money to uh, solve that emergency without having to incur uh credit card debt, which has a very high interest rate associated with it, or really any other kinds of debt uh, that might have interest rates associated with it that are higher than what you could earn on your uh, rate of return by investing that money. All right, so you want an emergency fund, and we're going to talk a little bit about that uh, here in the next slide uh, to set up for in case things go wrong, and as we're going to talk about, they usually do, it's just a matter of when. And the second thing you're going to want is a big purchase fund, right? This is kind of uh, you saving up for a big item like a uh, newer car or a house or a big trip you want to take. So, again, that you can uh, limit or eliminate having to finance these things in an effort to avoid uh, under uh, incurring a bunch of debt. And then the third one is a retirement fund. And this is uh, so that you can retire wealthy and enjoy life. And it's this kind of long-term investment in a retirement fund that's really going to help you become wealthy over time. And uh, hopefully, uh, as you all are listening to these uh, lectures, you're a little bit younger because the younger you are, then the more that this wealth can accumulate through that power of compound interest. Something, again, that we're going to be talking about in the near future. So with that in mind, uh, you want to begin paying into an emergency savings account every month. Again, it's not a matter of if things are going to go wrong, but just a matter of when, right? Everybody's going to uh, suffer those rainy days. Those rainy days could be an unexpected medical expenditure that uh, ends up uh, costing you a lot of money or preventing you from working, which uh, costs you a lot of your uh, income. Or it could be something like a, again, tree branch falling on your uh, house, right? Maybe your uh, roof needs to be fixed, right? Things that you're gonna have to pay a high deductible uh, in order to repair at some point. Uh, so make contributions to emergency savings account a regular part of your budget. And we will have another video here that talks about budgeting uh, so that you can see how that's done. But you want to have at least, at the very least, three months of your expenses saved up in case of an emergency. All right, so calculate your monthly expenses. Right, that could be your rent, uh, your uh, uh, um, utilities, right, the amount that you spend on food. Right, whatever you normally spend in a uh, one-month period, you want to multiply that by three, and you have at least that much in your emergency uh, savings account. Uh, with that in mind, I know that some people who are listening to this lecture might be high school students who don't have a lot of expenses, right? That's great. That means that your emergency savings account can be smaller for now, but as you start to grow up and go more out on your own, right, you're going to incur more expenses. You're going to want to build that emergency savings account up to match those expenses. Again, you want at least three months of expenses saved up, right? Uh, with that in mind, some experts advocate having up to six months of expenses in your emergency account, and that's not a bad idea either. Right, has uh, certain things like the recent pandemic has uh, shown us, right? You could end up uh, suffering some kind of emergencies that last longer than three months, uh, some emergencies that might cause you to be laid off, for, laid off for maybe six months at a time, right? So, how much you want to put into an emergency account is up to your personal level of risk aversion. If somebody likes to live on the edge a little bit more, then you might want to be closer to three months. If somebody likes to feel safer or have that peace of mind, then you might want to save up to six months. But the reason why you, it's kind of up to you here is because this money should be in a very highly liquid uh, account, right, so that you can access it if you need it. And those are the accounts that usually pay you the lowest rate of return. For example, a savings account, you might be lucky to get half of 1% rate of return on the money you have in that savings account. It's not a good place to store money for, when, uh, for it to grow over time. A savings account, though, is a good place to store money if you need to access it immediately, right, and that's what your emergency account is uh, for, right? So I guess it's kind of up to you uh, how much you want to put into this emergency account, depending on the level of risk that you're willing to accept. But once you have at least three to six months of expenses saved up, then you can lower your contributions to your emergency savings account and start putting more money in less liquid accounts with higher rates of return. If you're kind of uh, unsure about how much you want to put into that emergency savings account, my recommendation is that you 
put uh, a more significant amount of your paycheck into your emergency account until you get to at least three. And then you can start putting, say, smaller amounts into that emergency account uh, between three to six, all the way up to six. Once you have six months uh, uh, saved up, uh, six months of those expenses saved up, then you can start taking that uh, paycheck and start putting it into other accounts that are going to yield you a higher rate of return. Right. For example, your big purchase fund. All right, so the big purchase fund is from major, major items that you're planning to buy within a certain time frame. Uh, the most common examples of these items could include a new or newer car, right? It doesn't necessarily have to be off the showroom new, but it's certainly new to you. Uh, a house, right, is a big thing that a lot of people are saving up for in their big purchase fund. And then other uh, major purchases like a trip, vacation, or even a college education, right? These are all things that you could include into this big purchase fund. Now, the money for your big purchase fund should be put into an account that matures at the time that you expect to make a big purchase, right? These tend to be less liquid, but offer a higher rate of return than, say, your typical savings account. So once you have your three to six months saved up in your emergency account, right, then you want to uh, maybe put some money uh, aside in this big purchase fund. Or again, you can start doing this all together, depending on how much your income is, Right. But the big purchase fund is, uh, again, money that you might not be able to touch right away, but money that will yield a higher rate of return in exchange for you leaving it alone for a certain period of time. Right. So this could include, say, a uh, financial CD, although most financial CDs these days when interest rates are low offer you a pretty low rate of return. But for reference, a financial CD is an account where you put your money in for, say, a certain period of time. It could be like a one-year CD or a two-year CD or like a four-year CD. The longer the length of time that you promise to leave your money in that CD, uh, then the uh, usually the higher rate of return associated with that money there will be. So with that in mind, you can put your money into, say, a four-year CD. That means that you will um, probably get a higher rate of return on that money than if you put that money in, say, a two-year CD. Having said that, a four-year CD means that you can't touch that money for four years. If you try to take it out before that four-year period is up, then you're going to suffer a huge penalty, right? So again, CDs uh, were maybe a little bit more of the way to go in the past, but with interest rates being as low as they are on even CDs now, you might want to think of some other things like maybe bonds that would mature in the time period with which you're going to need the money. And what I mean by that is that for your big purchase fund, if you are looking to put money in, say, uh, uh, or save money for something like a house, and you have a deadline, like maybe a five-year uh, uh, time frame with which you want to start to think about moving into that house, then you want to put your money in maybe a bond that matures in five years or when you're going to need that money, right? And if you're thinking about maybe 10 or 15 years down the road for this house, then you might want to put in things that are safer uh, uh, to uh, house your money for that uh, 10 or 15-year period. Again, it could be a bond that matures in 10 years, or uh, when you're talking about 10 or 15 years out, there are, of course, mutual funds that are probably pretty safe at that point that are going to yield you a high rate of return. Right. So, again, that's kind of what you want to be thinking about with this big purchase fund. Now, to kind of give you some uh, cost-benefit analysis about uh, what to uh, buy with your big purchase fund, we're going to go through a couple of options here. Well, first of which is buying a used versus new car. Like, what should you do? What's safer to do? Uh one thing you need to know about new cars is that they lose substantial value as soon as they're driven off the lot. One thing that makes new cars worth a lot is that they're new. And as soon as you drive it off the lot for anything more than a test drive, it's not new anymore. It's considered used, right? So as soon as you buy that car, it's going to depreciate substantially in value. Now, some cars depreciate more than others. For example, I know that Jeeps tend to hold their value over time, uh, although I also know that they're fairly expensive to maintain. Uh, my most recent uh, car is a Subaru Outback. I've been told that they do a pretty good job of maintaining their value. But even still, as soon as you drive it off the lot, it's going to lose a lot of that value. All right. So should you buy a new car? Well, it depends on what your driving habits are going to be. Uh, if you're going to be driving a car for 10 plus years, uh, then I'd say you could consider going with a new car, particularly if you have the money to buy it. Uh, in other words, uh, I wouldn't be spending, say, forty or $50,000 on a new car if you only make forty or $50,000. You're going to have to finance it for that uh, full 10-year period, right? But if you're thinking about maybe a $20,000 car when you make, say, uh, $50,000, and you can pay it off in maybe four or five years and then can keep driving it for, say, another 10 years after that, then that might be a way with which you go for a new car. Right? But the general rule of thumb is that you don't want to finance anything longer than its useful life, which means that you want to be using the car long after you're done paying for it 
the last thing you want to do is buy a new car that you're going to spend five years paying down and then buy say another car three years in so that you're still paying off the old car while you're still driving the uh, um, the new car right that's bad business so you don't want to be paying something off long after you're done using it you want it the other way around where you're using it long after you're done paying it off right so my most recent car uh, purchase was a uh, Subaru Outback uh, as I just mentioned, and I, I was able to finance it for a four-year period at 0% interest because I have a uh, pretty good credit history, so they're actually able to give me 0% for four years, right? And I'm currently uh, in the third year of paying that off, but I plan for this to be my car for the next, say, 10 or 15 years, right? In other words, I plan on driving it for at least 10 or 11 years long after I'm done paying for it, right? And that's kind of how you want to do it if you want to go after a new car, Again, uh, I could have paid cash for this car if I wanted to, but at 0% interest, it didn't make a lot of sense to do that, right? Because I can still hold on to a lot of my money and invest it while I'm paying it down uh, and not having to incur any extra interest payments, right? So again, um, if you're going after a new car, make sure you're going to be driving it for a long period of time. Now, used cars tend to have higher maintenance costs because they've been around for a lot longer and have a lot more miles on them, but the depreciation costs are much lower. So if you're only going to drive a car for, say, maybe three or five years, then you're probably going to go on to go with a used car, right? So again, that's the idea. Um, my very first car was a uh, 1992 Chevy Caprice. It was actually burgundy like the one in this picture. It wasn't the one in this picture. I don't have a picture of it, right? But this is kind of what it looked like. And um, so I bought that car when I was uh, about uh, 16 years old. Um, I paid, uh, I believe it was uh, $1,500 for it. It was actually a old uh, squad car, so it was used by the police department. Then it got turned into a taxi, and then I got it with about 178,000 miles on it. So I drove that car for three years. I did have to uh, put some money into it maintenance-wise, but I, I did drove it for about three years, and then I sold it for 1200 right, uh, three years later. So again, I bought it for 1500 drove it for three years, sold it for 1200 only really lost $300 in depreciation on that car. Whereas if I had bought a new car, drove it for three years, and then sold it, I probably would have lost maybe five or $6,000 in depreciation expenses on that car, right? So again, if I was only going to drive a car for three years, then that uh, 92 used Chevy Caprice was the way to go, right? But again, if you're going to be driving a car for a very long period of time, it's not necessarily a bad idea to go new if, again, you have the money to buy it. Um, with that in mind, again, the rule of thumb here is don't finance anything for longer than its useful life. Make sure you're driving that car long after you're done paying for it, right? There's nothing better than driving a paid-for car that you don't have to worry about too much um, and uh, saving whatever money you would pay towards that uh, those car payments, putting that in, say, an investment fund and watching your wealth grow. And so that's kind of what we're going to be talking about uh, in the future of this particular presentation. All right. So, again, whether you want to go new or used, that's up to you. Uh, but I would suggest only going new if you're going to be driving that new car for a very long period of time. If you're going to be driving that car for a short period of time, I would suggest going used. Of course, that all, all of this depends also where your finances are. Uh, renting an apartment versus buying a house is a very big decision that you're going to have to make, and there's a lot of things that go into that particular decision. Uh, there are some advantages to renting an apartment, right? One of which is that it tends to be a lower cost for renting an apartment than it is for, say, uh, paying your mortgage on a house. And the utilities for apartments tend to be lower simply because the uh, space that's being heated or cooled tends to be smaller, right? Um, and some of those utilities are covered by the apartment complex. Right, so lower monthly costs for housing and utilities is a big advantage of renting. So you can rent while you're saving up for maybe that big purchase like a house. Uh, you have less time and effort spent on maintenance issues when you're renting. If something happens with your toilet, you call your landlord. Your landlord is responsible for you com for uh, coming in and fixing your toilet. Right, same thing if the uh, uh, lights go out or if uh, something goes wrong. Right, it's usually the landlord's responsibility to fix it. You don't have those same ownership responsibilities when you're renting. Right. And then you also have more flexibility to move, and that's important, right? If you think you're only going to be in an area for, say, a couple, maybe two to three years, right, then renting is probably going to be the best option for you because it's easier for you to pick up and move. You don't have to go through the process of selling a home in order to do so, which will be pretty time-consuming and a uh, tough thing to do, right? So you get a lot more flexibility there uh, when you're renting. 
Now, the advantages of owning a home, uh, one of which is probably one of the biggest, is that you're building equity in an asset that is expected to increase in value over time. Right? Generally speaking, uh, as uh, years go by, your house is going to be worth more and more. Right? You tend to see an increase in housing market in most areas. Right? Again, barring a few exceptions like maybe that 2007-2008 uh, financial crisis that we went through right, where home values uh, decreased uh, in that uh, period of time. Right, but the idea is that when you are putting money into paying a mortgage, right, then that is going to uh, uh, put money towards something that you're going to own over time. So, for example, if you pay, say, a thousand dollars a month in rent, right, that's twelve thousand dollars a year. If you do that for 20 years, you will pay two hundred and forty thousand dollars renting an apartment. And at the end of that 20 years, if you decide to move or buy a house or whatever, right, you've paid two hundred and forty thousand dollars renting an apartment and you don't have really anything to show for it except that you got to live there during that 20 year period. Whereas if you spend 20 years, maybe you're uh, uh, spending fifteen hundred dollars a month on that home mortgage, but a thousand of that is going towards your principal. Right. Well, then you're going to spend that same uh, um, two hundred and forty thousand uh, dollars towards a principal and own a two hundred and forty thousand dollar home at the end of that 20 year period. Right. So you're spending a little bit more. You're actually spending uh, three hundred and sixty thousand dollars over that 20 year period because it's more expensive to pay for that house. Right. But at the end of that period, you're going to have a two hundred and forty thousand dollar home, whereas at the end of renting, you don't have anything. So spending $240,000 and having zero at the end means that you're out $240,000. Spending $360,000 but having a $240,000 asset at the end means that you only really lost $120,000, right? About half as much, right? Finding, uh, spending money on a place to live. And there's a good chance that that home's going to be worth more than the $240,000 that you uh, uh, paid for or that you established that mortgage for, right? Simply because, again, the value of that home tends to increase over time. Right. Uh, also, in owning a home, you tend to have more control over that property and how you want to use it, right? And that's important, right? So again, so you might uh, decide that you want to paint your walls a certain color, or build an addition onto your house, or maybe put a pool in the backyard. These are all things that you can do when you own a home that you can't really do when you are renting an apartment, right? So again, you have more control over how you use the uh, space or property. Right. Having said that, not only do you have more control over how you use the space or property, but you do, uh, again, remember, have to fix anything that goes wrong with that home. So you do have those ownership responsibilities as well. And then another big advantage of owning a home is tax savings in the sense that you can actually write off the interest that you pay on your mortgage on your taxes, right, so that your tax bill can be lower at the end of the year. Right. So, again, you have a bit of a tax break if you are owning a home versus if you are renting an apartment. And that's something worth considering, right? But remember that owning a home is expensive, all right? Uh, although it is more likely to increase your overall net wealth over time, because again, you're paying down an asset versus just paying for a space to live, right? Remember that you will be spending more money over that period of time, uh, not only uh, paying the expenses of owning a home, but also fixing up the home if something were to happen to it. All right, so to give you an idea, uh, these are the kinds of things that you have to expect to pay when you own a home. Right, uh, so you have your mortgage payment, which includes the principal and the interest that you pay on your mortgage loan. Uh, very few people actually have the cash to pay for a home outright, so you usually have to get a, a mortgage, and that gets divided up into two payments. Your principal, which is what goes towards your actual equity in the home or your ownership of it, and interest, which is what you're paying the bank for the pleasure of them loaning you the money so that you can live in that house now versus later. Now notice that the principal is blue and the interest is red. That's because you don't really lose the money on the principal, right? Uh, that is actually money that's just being transferred from your bank account into ownership over the house. So you don't really lose that money. It just gets transferred into your home or the value of your home, whereas you do lose money on the interest, right? So for example, if you make a housing payment and let's say that your principal and interest are $1,200, right? A thousand of it goes towards the principal, 200 goes towards the interest. You're not out that thousand dollars, right? You just have a thousand dollars more of ownership in that home, and the bank has a thousand dollars less of that ownership in the home. But that two hundred dollars that goes towards the bank and in interest that you do lose, right? So keep that in mind. All right now, another thing you have to pay is property taxes, right? So we talked about maybe paying fifteen hundred dollars a month for a home versus a thousand dollars a month for renting an apartment. Again, uh, that fifteen hundred dollars could be a thousand dollars principal, two hundred dollars interest, right? But it could also include property taxes. 
right, which differ depending on where you live. But that's something you have to pay when you own a home and that you don't have to pay when you rent an apartment, right? And so you'll be paying that usually monthly with your mortgage payment, right? You also are required to have homeowner's insurance, particularly if you do have a mortgage. If you don't, it's still a good idea to have homeowner's insurance in case something happens to that home, right? And that could uh, round out, again, some of that uh, $1,500 payment. So you, you pay that maybe every month along with your mortgage payment, right? Uh, depending on where you live, you could have what's called a homeowner's association fee. So maybe you live in a neighborhood that has a communal pool and uh, you have to pay a fee to help with the upkeep of that communal pool. Or maybe it's a neighborhood that just wants to make sure things are a certain way, that everybody's lawn is mowed and they issue you a citation or a violation fee if, you're, if it's not, right, in order to pay for uh, ensuring that everybody's lawn is mowed so that the neighborhood looks nice, right, you may be belonging to a homeowner's association and pay an HOA fee. I'm not a huge fan of HOA fees myself, so when I looked uh, for a house recently, I made sure to look for one that did not have an HOA fee, but some people like them because again, it makes sure that everybody's doing their part to take care of the neighborhood, right? So that is potentially an extra fee that you might have to pay. Uh, generally speaking, when you own a home, you usually have to pay more utilities than when you rent an apartment, simply because, uh, again, the space that you are heating or cooling, it tends to be a lot bigger, right? So it requires more energy to do that. None of that, but you're going to have to pay for all your own, say, trash removal or the other things that the city might do. Whereas in the apartment, that fee might be split over all of its residents, right? So usually a higher utility payment comes with owning a home as well, right? Uh, mortgage insurance is something that you might have to pay depending on how much you put down towards the home. So generally speaking, it is recommended, and I personally recommend this as well, that you have a 20% down payment uh, towards whatever home you are going to buy. So however much the uh, selling price of the home is, you want 20% of that amount that you can give the bank immediately and then uh, borrow the other 80%. Because anything less than a 20% down payment makes you a little bit more of a riskier borrower. So you have to pay what's called mortgage insurance, right? Which means that you have another monthly payment on top of your uh, uh, property taxes and homeowners insurance and principal and interest, right? On top of that, you're going to have this mortgage insurance that you might have to pay, right? Because you didn't have that 20% down payment, right? So just to give you an idea of how much that is, if you were, say, paying, uh, trying to buy that $240,000 home, right, then you're going to have to have 20% of that $240,000, which comes out to about $48,000. So you need to have $48,000 saved, right, in order to have the full 20% of that $240,000 home. And another thing that you have to think about that a lot of people don't is the closing costs on the initial purchase of the home. And this can be uh, quite expensive. It can be about 2 to 3% of the value of that home, right? So depending on how much your home is, expect about 2 to 3% of that, uh, again, selling price of your home for you, uh, something that you might have to pay in closing costs. So again, if you're talking about a home that costs about uh, $200,000 or so, then you're looking at, uh, you know, maybe um, uh, four to $6,000 in uh, closing costs. And what those are, is those are fees that you pay for lawyers and uh, uh, um, other experts to do things like uh, transfer the title over to your name, right? Uh, there's a lot of stuff that goes into that that's uh, uh, even beyond my grasp of understanding, but yeah, you can expect about 2 to 3% of the value of the home to be in closing costs, and you have to have that up front, right? So not only do you have to have the 48000 down, but you might have to have another 6000 in closing costs. That's $54,000 that you're going to need to have before you even decide whether or not you want to purchase a house, right? So keep that, uh, that $240,000 house anyway, right? So kind of uh, keep that in mind, right? If you're interested in checking out, uh, you know, again, um, more detail, the costs and benefits of buying a home and maybe how you should finance it. Should you get a 30-year mortgage or a 15-year mortgage, right? Should you do monthly payments or bi-weekly payments or anything like that, right? Then you want to check out the presentation entitled Home Sweet Home, right, uh, for further information about buying a house and reading that amortization schedule and uh, also have an amortization schedule provided for you uh, in addition to that uh, presentation so that you can play with those numbers on your own and to see how, and, uh, see how you want to do it. Uh, I don't have any standard recommendations there because it really depends on what kind of uh, uh, interest rate you can get on your mortgage versus the rate of return you can get on other investments, right? Uh, generally speaking, um, you know, there, it just depends on which one's higher as to what you should do when it comes to buying that uh, house, right? But again, if you're more interested in that, make sure you check out that presentation. 
Uh, as far as the major trip, vacation, or other purchases are concerned, that might be something else you want to save up for. Um, I am an economics professor by trade, so I'm going to go over a little bit of economics, in particular uh, the law of diminishing marginal utility, which just says that as the consumption of a product increases, the marginal utility derived from additional consumption will eventually decline. And basically what we mean by that is that you tend to get tired of stuff the more stuff you have. And the more you have something, then the less uh, valuable that thing might start to look to you, right? So if you buy, say, a brand new Mercedes, then that's going to feel really awesome to drive for, say, the first uh, maybe three to six months. But after six months, it's just your car, just like any other car would be just your car, right? And the same thing is true with a lot of things, right? The pleasure of owning things tends to decrease over time, right? So when you're thinking about saving up in your big purchase fund for things like a car and a house, right, those are certainly things that you might need, right? But you might also want to be thinking about, do I really need that new uh, Mercedes or can I get by with maybe a cheaper used car? Do I really need that uh, 3,000 square foot mansion if it's just maybe me and one other person? Or should we get by on maybe a 1,600 square foot home that's uh, uh, maybe much smaller and cheaper? Right, because again, the value or the happiness you're going to get from owning that uh, uh, that uh, new car or the value or happiness you're going to get from having that huge mansion, that tends to decrease over time, right? Having said that, your experiences, the happiness you get from those tend to not necessarily decrease over time as much because you can always fondly remember them. Uh, people are often happier, it's been shown, when they do spend their money on experiences over things. So I'm not saying that you should stay in your parents' basement and then spend uh, money on trips around the world. You definitely want to have things like a car and a place to live taken care of, right? But I'm just saying rather than spending extra money on maybe uh, more house than you need or extra money on newer, nicer cars than you uh, really should have, right? You might want to be thinking about putting that money into things like uh, – Maybe running a uh, big race or accomplishing some personal goal like that. So this first picture is me and my family at the uh, World's Toughest Mudder, which is a 24-hour race where you see how many five-mile obstacle course uh, loops that you can do within that 24-hour period. So that's me right there. I was able to uh, uh, get through that uh, course about 12 times for 60 miles. It is not only a great personal accomplishment for me, but I have fond memories of that that I'll never forget. I uh, frequently travel as a uh, uh, development economist to different areas of the world and kind of help uh, with uh, economic development projects. I was doing one over in uh, Tanzania, and over there is the highest freestanding mountain in the world or the tallest peak in uh, uh, Africa, Mount Kilimanjaro. And it cost some money to go on a climbing expedition of that mountain, but if you can do it, uh, again, it was a great experience, uh, something I'll never, ever regret paying for. Uh, getting to the uh, getting to the top of that mountain was again not only a personal accomplishment but something I just enjoy doing, right? And again, uh, I would much rather have some of these experiences than it would maybe some things that I've spent money on, right? So again, a lot of people will tell you, you know, don't spend your money on frivolous experiences. You know, you need to buy a house, you need to buy a car, you need to become a functioning member of society, and all that stuff is important. But I wouldn't buy more car than you need or more house than you need. Because, again, ultimately, that's not the stuff that tends to make people happy, according to some of this happiness research. Right? Experiences do that, and so you want to definitely save some money for those. And that's what your big purchase fund is for. Speaking of which, what about college and student loans? Uh, I'm not going to tell you to avoid uh, uh, going to college or avoid taking out student loans, but I will tell you that you should definitely be smart about it. Uh, on average, college graduates earn at least $30,000 more per year than high school graduates, and they average at least a million dollars more in earnings in their lifetime than high school graduates. So college is definitely a worthwhile venture, right? Having said that, uh, taking out student loans is not always advisable. It depends on kind of what you're working towards. If you take out a student loan to work towards a degree that is going to uh, give you a job that's going to pay you a lot more than you would have earned having not gone to college, right, then that student loan is probably a more realistic investment for you. In other words, if you need to take out, say, uh, $40,000 in student loans, but you're going towards, say, a uh, engineering or biochemistry degree or something like that, that's going to grant you, say, a $60,000 job when you graduate versus, say, maybe a $28,000 job, uh, versus was, which is what you could get right out of high school, right? Then it's probably going to be worth it to take out that student loan, right? Now, if you're going to take out a student loan to get a, say, music history degree so that you can work uh, behind the counter, uh, sales counter, and say, a guitar shop, 
well, that's probably not really advisable because you can probably get that job right out of high school even without that music history degree. And it's probably not going to pay you a lot more than what you would have earned right out of high school without any degree at all. Right. So, again, you're taking out a huge amount of student loans for a degree that might not pay you the amount of money needed to pay down that student loan in the future. And that's not something that I would consider uh, doing. Right. So I'm not telling you what to major in. I'm just saying that if you want to major in something that's not going to pay a lot in the future, then I wouldn't necessarily take out a student loan to do it because you might not ever catch up and you're going to be stuck in debt for a long period of time. Right. Uh, one thing I will suggest that you do is save money by completing your general education requirements at a community college and then transfer to the college from which you wish to graduate in the future. Um, you know, a lot of people uh, kind of give community college a bad stigma. As somebody who's uh, uh, only uh, taught at uh, big four-year universities, uh, so I graduated from West Virginia University. I then uh, got a job teaching at Florida State University, and now I'm teaching at the University of California, Riverside, right? Uh, you know, you hear people say, oh, I'm so happy to be at these types of schools, and they're good schools to go to, right? But here's the deal is that the only school that matters is the one that you graduate from. That's the only uh, thing that they see on your resume. And you can save a lot of money by maybe spending your first two years at a community college, and getting those uh, general education requirements out of the way there, and then transferring to a college like, say, Florida State or UC Riverside or UC Berkeley or Harvard or wherever it is that you might be able to get into, right? And then, because no matter what, that's going to be what's on your resume. That's what's going to be on your uh, degree, right? Then nobody cares that you spent your first two years knocking out your general education requirements at community college. And that's something you might want to think about doing because community colleges tend to be a lot cheaper, so you can maybe cut the cost of that college degree uh, pretty close to in half by spending um, uh, some time at a community college and then transferring to the college from which you graduate uh, once you get those general education requirements uh, uh, knocked out. And another good reason why I like the idea of doing some of these uh, uh, community college classes first is because when you go to a big four-year university, like say a West Virginia University or Florida State University, you're going to get around different kinds of people uh, you're getting around a group of people who's really there to study and work hard and get their degree, but you're also going to get around a group of people who, you know, wanted to attend that school because it was one of the biggest party schools in the country, and they want to spend a lot of time maybe drinking or engaging in activities that's not related to their education, and while those things uh, can certainly be fun, there are also things that could distract you from doing well in school, and you want to avoid that distraction, and usually that uh, people who are engaged in that uh, distractive activity are weeded out for the most part in the first couple years. So you spend your first two years at a community college and then you transfer to a, uh, a bigger four-year university, then you're going to be taking classes with juniors and seniors who have kind of survived those first two years. And these are the ones who are going to be more serious about finishing their degree and completing their education. I know at both Western University and at Florida State University, there was a lot of people who went to those uh, schools just because there were big uh, sports programs there that they enjoyed rooting for. And they spent a lot of their time, say, drinking and tailgating before uh, football games and then attending football games and spending the week talking about football and spent very little time in class and uh, failing out. And again, you can get caught in that trap. Uh, if you feel like you're somebody who's likely to be caught in that trap, you might want to avoid it entirely by spending those years at community colleges where people, uh, for the most part, are there to try to work and advance themselves and then, again, transfer into that uh, bigger uh, university that you plan to graduate from uh, at a time where you'll be taking classes with other like-minded individuals who are also working hard to, to, to uh, complete their degree. And finally, don't forget that you can also save a lot of money by exploring scholarships and fellowships. Uh, that's uh, definitely something that you want to be looking into. I know that when I uh, um, uh, went to West Virginia University as an undergrad, I got uh, a partial academic scholarship, which is another big piece of advice is make sure you work hard in high school. I know a lot of people don't think, you know, as long as I get good enough grades to get into college, it doesn't really matter to me, uh, uh, you know, if I have like uh, A pluses or uh, B minuses, right? Either way, I'm, I'll probably be able to get into school. And you probably can get into, uh, uh, you know, your safety schools with your B minuses or even your C pluses or whatever, right? But if you can start really getting good grades in high school, then you can probably get some of that college paid for through an academic scholarship. So again, I had that a lot of my uh, undergraduate college uh, paid for through a partial academic scholarship. And some of it I was able to pay for through money I saved up working through high school. And then some of it I got uh, paid for through a, uh, a uh, account set up by my grandmother, 
right? So I was able to leave undergraduate without uh, my, I was able to leave uh, my undergraduate uh, education or graduate with my uh, undergraduate degree with no student loans. And then because I did so well in uh, undergraduate, I was actually able to get a teaching assistant ship or a fellowship with uh, uh, that same West Virginia University for graduate school. And actually not only paid for all of my uh, graduate school classes, but it also gave me a small living stipend because I was working as a teaching assistant. So I didn't have to take out any loans for graduate school either. So I was able to get my bachelor's, master's, and PhD uh, without having any student loans by the end of it. And if you can do that, I highly recommend it. But again, taking out student loans isn't necessarily the wrong choice if you're working towards a degree that's going to pay you more. But if you can avoid it, then by all means, try to do so. And the best way, one of the best ways to avoid it is, again, cutting down on the cost by maybe going to the community college first uh, and or uh, a combination of these uh, exploring scholarships and fellowships that are going to help you pay for your uh, schooling. All right. So, again, think about that as well. All right, so now we've gone through the emergency account and the big purchase fund. Another thing that you really want to start ramping up is your retirement account. And the earlier you can do this, the better. I cannot stress that enough. I wish I had taken a class like this when I was in uh, high school or, or uh, my early years of college because I would have put more money into a retirement account uh, because, again, the, the earlier you start, then the more this is going to rack up. All right. So your retirement account is going to consist of long-term investments that are less liquid, but offer a higher rate of return over a long period of time. This is money that you shouldn't be touching immediately because um, uh, you get huge penalties for taking money out of some of these kinds of retirement accounts. Uh, but again, because you're going to be putting them into something like a mutual fund for a long period of time, then you're really going to be able to get a higher rate of return as a result of that, right? So these are uh, mutual funds or accounts that can be risky if you try to uh, play them uh, quickly. Like in the day-to-day, -day, buying stocks can be a risky endeavor. But putting your money in a large number of unrelated stocks like a mutual fund for a long period of time actually tends to be pretty safe. And we'll talk a little bit about what kinds of funds you might want to consider. All right. Now, these investments are probably the most likely way that you can become very rich throughout the course of your life. Of course, you could be somebody who invents a, uh, uh, something that uh, is going to make you very uh, rich. You could be somebody who's incredibly talented, either in athletics or uh, entertainment or whatever. And all that stuff can make you rich. But the way that most people are going to become rich is through saving and investing. And again, saving and investing in these kinds of retirement accounts. And again, the earlier you start saving, the richer you will become. Right. So they asked uh, Albert Einstein, at least this is the, uh, uh, the lore here, what the most powerful force in the universe is. And he said compound interest. And we're going to talk about why that's true as part of this particular uh, lecture here. Right. But again, the idea is that the earlier you start saving, the more that you're, this interest is going to compound. In other words, the more money the bank is going to pay you for having money. Right. And that's something that's really important for building wealth over time. Right. So when you put your money in a certain account, right, like a mutual fund, right, you're going to get a rate of return. And then that rate of return is going to be used to own even more uh, of that uh, stock or even more of that mutual fund, which then is going to give you an even higher rate of return in the future. Right. So you put your money in an account and the bank's going to pay you for having that principal or that amount of money in your account. Right? They're going to pay you a certain amount of return or interest on that. And then the next year, they're going to pay you on that principal plus whatever interest they paid you before. That's what we mean by compound interest. It's a snowball that rolls downhill and gets big very quickly. And again, the earlier you start, the bigger it's going to get. So it doesn't take a lot of savings now to create a lot of wealth in the distant future, right? So if even saving a little bit now and putting it into a retirement account could lead to a large sum of money later on, right? So for example, um, most drinks at Starbucks might cost you at least $3, right? If you're, say, a 18-year-old freshman in college, right, and you're somebody who needs your daily caffeine fix to get up for class, you think, I would just go to Starbucks every day and get a $3 coffee. After all, it's only $3, right? Well, just know that spending $3 every day for 365 days a year adds up to about $1,095 for that year, right? So imagine if you forego your daily Starbucks drink and invest that money in your retirement account instead. So what I have here is a link to a compound interest calculator that you can use to exactly figure out how much money you'd have at retirement if you did that very thing that I just talked about, and that is forego your uh, Starbucks coffee. 
right? So again, if you click on that link, it should pull up this compound interest calculator here, right? So again, imagine that you're starting with zero dollars. That shouldn't be too hard to imagine. Most people, that's pretty realistic. You could start out with zero, right? And imagine if instead of spending three bucks at Starbucks every morning, you instead put that uh, $3 aside to something that you could put into your retirement account every year. So that's $1,095 that you put in that retirement account every year rather than um, uh, spending it on the coffee in the morning. Now, most retirement accounts, right, uh, uh, thing, the kinds of mutual funds that you're going to be keeping over a long period of time, right, will pay about 7 to 8% uh, rate of return on average. Uh, you know, depending on which ones you get, you could actually get a lot more than that. But again, if we're going to be conservative, in other words, if we're going to uh, pick a number here on the low end, just to show you that even on the low end, you could be making a lot of money by doing this, right? We're just going to go with 7%, right? I wouldn't really expect too much less than that. Again, 7% is about the lower, lower end of the average that you can expect. Now, years to grow depends on how old you are when you decide to do this, right? In other words, if you are an 18-year-old, then that means that you have more time to start saving this money and putting it into your retirement account and more time for that money in your account to build up that compound interest, right? So let's say that you're 18 years old and you decide to start doing this, right? Well, then you are uh, going to be uh, saving until maybe you retire at 65. That's going to be 47 years right, uh, foregoing your Starbucks and putting that into your account, right? So 47 years of putting a $1,000, uh, about $1,000 into your account, right, should come out to uh, maybe a little over $47,000, right? So you might be thinking, ah, maybe about $60,000 uh, or so is what I should have in there, right? But you're not thinking about that rate of return that's compounding, right? So when you actually do this calculation, you come out to about $385,735, Right, so you got just under about 400 grand there, right? That you are actually going to have in the account just by saving that thousand, uh, a little over a thousand dollars a year, right? Uh, by foregoing that Starbucks coffee. Now, again, this is why it's important to start this early. Imagine rather than starting at 18, you decide to start at say 28. You say, you know what? I mean, college is tough, but I got to get up early for classes. Not only that, but, uh, you know, when I get my first job, that's going to be tough, right? I'm going to need my Starbucks in the morning. I'll start doing this at 28 and not at 18, right? And that's only going to give you 37 years uh, for this to grow, right? And uh, which case, that money's only going to come out to $187,859, right? Again, that's if you just wait 10 years, right? That's you saving about $11,000 less, right? Uh just saving $11,000 more, but more importantly, doing it 10 years earlier, right? That's what gets you from 187,000 up to 385,000, right? So again, you're going to lose about $200,000, right? By waiting those 10 years, even though you are only saving $11,000 less, you're going to lose about $189,000 in compound interest, right? I Means you're going to lose, uh, you know, nearly $190,000 in money that the bank's going to give you for having money 10 years earlier versus having money 10 years later. Right. So it's important to do things like save just a little bit in order to make sure that you um, uh, can start contributing to that retirement account earlier. Right. Now, if you want to see a um, uh, some examples of this, I have an assignment that you can uh, utilize called uh, the same name of this presentation. Saving makes sense. And it kind of uses this compound interest calculator in such a way to help you make some decisions about how to build wealth. Right. One of the examples is the saving three dollars a day. Another one is maybe instead of binge watching Netflix uh, three days a week, you go out and you walk uh, dogs for maybe uh, ten dollars an hour. Right. For those three days. And you put that money in a retirement account right, and see how much that's going to add up to by the time you actually do end up retiring. Right. So these are all things that you can kind of think about. And again, the younger you are, then the more of an advantage in time you have in terms of making these kinds of contributions. Right. So if you're thinking, ah, I'm only 16, all right, I shouldn't even have to worry about this. Well, 16 is the is one of the best times to start. I'd much rather you start at 16 than at 26 in terms of uh, uh, really saving for that retirement or that future, right? Uh, again, it might not be Starbucks that you're spending three dollars on, but it might be say a Gatorade or a bag of chips from the vending machine uh, every day that you're spending two or three dollars on. Again, imagine that you're not spending that, but saving that instead and putting it in a retirement account. Right, it's going to add up to a lot of money over time. All right. So let's talk about how to easily and most effectively save for your retirement account. One thing that you're going to do is you want to be able to save automatically. 
and there's a couple of different ways you can do this. When you actually start making a paycheck, uh, you can actually have money uh, automatically deducted from your paycheck uh, and transferred from your bank account to your retirement fund. So there's ways that you can set that up through your bank. That means that you won't even have to worry about it since it's automatically deducted, right? You just uh, look at the paycheck that uh, you have left over and you don't even have to worry about saving because you've already had that automatically done for you. Uh, for those of you who prefer to kind of keep track of every dollar and where it's going, that's something I also highly recommend, right? Then you want to include a plan to save in your budget. If you're thinking, I don't have a budget, well, fear not. I've actually uh, created a zero-based budgeting presentation and assignment that uh, uh, can help you learn how to budget your money and make sure you know where every dollar is going, right? So uh, make sure you check out that, uh, that uh, presentation and assignment link as well, right, as part of this uh, personal finance uh, uh, series, Right, that's really going to help you uh, not only save money, but see where that money is going so you know where to cut back, where you can spend more, and again, make sure you have that money going into your retirement account. Now, you also want to make sure that you save strategically, and uh, particularly through tax-deferred savings. And there's different ways you can do that, like your 401k, your traditional IRAs. IRA is just an acronym for Individual Retirement Account. You also have uh, Roth IRAs, and again, Roth individual retirement accounts. And we'll talk a little bit about how those are different and which ones you should go with, right? So I know that there's a lot of uh, numbers and letters being thrown at you, like, ah, I don't even know what any of this means. Adulting sucks. Uh, well, I can agree it can be kind of overwhelming, but I'm going to break it down for you as easily as I can. So again, you kind of know what this stuff is before your employers or your financial advisors are kind of hitting you with it, right? So let's talk a little bit about what a 401k is, right? So if you get a job, chances are that job might, uh, might as uh, part of their benefits package, have what's called a 401k program. If you happen to work in education, like as a college professor, they tend to be called 403bs, but it's the same idea. And basically what it is, is a pre-tax contribution to your own retirement account through your employer. And it is limited up to $19,500 a year as of the year 2020. So depending on when you're watching this, right, it might uh, the uh, co contribution limit might uh, increase, right? They tend to increase a little bit every year. So by 2021, you know, it might be a little bit higher than that. But in any case, basically what we mean by a pre-tax contribution is that whatever money you put in your 401k, the government pretends like you don't make that money, so they don't tax you on it like they would your other income, right? So the way it works is that. Uh, with this uh, pre-tax contribution, if you make, say, $50,000 a year and you put $5,000 into your 401k, then the government taxes you as if you only make $45,000 that year. The other $5,000, the government doesn't tax you on, right? So they don't take any amount of money out of that $5,000. Now, when you retire and you take that money out of your 401k, then the government taxes it as income then. But the idea is that that uh, 40 years or however long that that money's in your account, right, that full $5,000, right, where none of the taxes were taken out, is allowed to help, uh, is allowed to grow and turn into a greater amount of money. Whereas if you didn't put it into a 401k and just put it into a mutual fund outside of this kind of tax savings account, then again, the government would take a piece of it. And so you might only have, say, $4,500, depending on what tax bracket you're in, uh, to uh, start growing versus the full $5,000. Right. So, again, you can save a lot of money from the government or save money in your taxes by putting it into this 401k. And, again, this isn't some trick that the IRS doesn't know about. This is something that they set up and encourage you to do, right, just because they want people to start saving for their own retirement. Um, you know, this might be a bit uh, out, on, you know, out on a limb, but I would say that uh, given the growth rate of population in our country, it's very unlikely that Social Security is going to be as uh, uh, sustainable as we'd like it to be. In other words, I would say for your retirement as if Social Security is not going to be there because there's a good chance that it might not. Uh, so you want to make sure you take care of your own retirement. And then if Social Security is there, that's uh, even better. That's going to give you more money to retire on. But again, if it's not, you'll still be covered by your own contributions. Now, this is a retirement account. The government is giving you a break in terms of lowering your tax bill by putting money into it. So they're going to put in some restrictions to make sure you keep it there for your retirement. And one of those restrictions is that you're not allowed to take any money out of this account until you turn 59 and a half years old, right? Any withdrawals before you turn 59 and a half is subject to an additional 10% in taxes beyond your normal income taxes, right? So anything that you take out, right, you've got to pay 10% of it in taxes, and then it's going to get taxed as income when you take it out. 
All right, so to avoid that additional 10% penalty, make sure you're only putting money in your 401k that you don't need or that you're not going to touch until you're at 59 and a half years old. Right. So again, it's very important that you realize that there is a cost of putting money in this kind of retirement account, and that is that it's far less liquid and that you can't really touch it without uh, subjecting yourself to this kind of penalty. But again, it's worth it if it's money that you can uh, do without right now and that you're not going to touch to put it in there to save that tax bill. Right. Now, some employers, as part of their benefits package, will match your 401k contributions. Right. So, uh, for example, they'll say, hey, every dollar you put into your 401k will contribute an extra dollar into your 401k, maybe up to a certain amount or up to a certain percentage of your paycheck. Right. So let's say that uh, government says, or not the government, but your employer says that we'll match you dollar for dollar on your 401k contributions up to, say, maybe five thousand dollars or up to, say, 10 percent of your paycheck. If that's the case, then, or 10% of your uh, annual income. If that's the case, then you definitely want to contribute to the full amount that they're going to match you for, because that's essentially free money from your employer, right? So if you can put that $5,000 into your 401k, then your employer is also going to put $5,000 into your 401k. That is $10,000 total that's going to go into your 401k, of which only 5,000 of it is yours. The other 5,000 comes from your employer. And again, employers will do this because they're trying to attract uh, uh, talented workers like hopefully you uh, when you graduate from college or uh, when you uh, develop your skills and whatever it is your, prof your chosen profession is, right? If you're one of the more talented workers out there, you might have employers fighting over you. And one employer says, hey, we match your 401k contributions. The other employer says we don't, right? Well, then that's going to encourage you to go to the employer that matches those contributions. So that's one reason why they do it. And again, if they do match you, then you want to fund it for the full amount that they're going to match you for, because that's almost like free money from your employer. Now, again, just be aware that you're not going to be able to touch that money until you turn 59 and a half. So make sure that you can't afford to put that much in there, right? And that you won't need to take it out before you retire. Uh, and again, again, you're, you are limited up to $19,000, uh, $19,500 a year as of at least 2020 when this presentation was made. All right. I know a lot of you are saying, well, 401k, Job, I'm only 16, I'm only 20 years old, uh, there's um, you know, not a job I have that has that kind of uh, uh, package associated with it. Well, that's fine. You don't necessarily need to have a job that offers a 401k to start saving for your retirement. That's what these IRAs are for. So you have these uh, individual retirement accounts that allows people to put money away for their retirement right, without necessarily having a job that pays them, uh, that offers a 401k benefit, right. And so a traditional IRA works just like a 401k. You just don't do it through your employer. You do it through your uh, uh, personal financial advisor or whatever bank that you have your money in. And basically, it's, again, it's a pre-tax contribution to your own retirement account held individually through, again, a broker or a bank. And that is limited up to $6,000 a year if you're under 50 years old. If you're over 50 years old, then you can contribute up to $7,000 a year. Again, these are numbers as of 2020, but they tend to, to go up every uh, year or every other year. So they might be a little bit higher in 2021 or 2022. As of right now, most of you I imagine are going to be under 50. You can put up to $6,000 uh, a year in there. Any teachers teaching this, if you're over 50, right, you can put up to uh, $7,000 a year in there. And again, it works just like a 401k. And that if you make $60,000 a year and you put, say, $6,000 into your traditional IRA, then you get taxed as if you only make $54,000 that year. So that $6,000, that full amount, the government doesn't touch and it can grow into you, in your retirement account uh, tax-free. Now, again, when you take it out later, right, you get taxed on it as if, as if it's income. But again, that full amount gets to uh, grow and you get that return on that full amount right, if you put it into this traditional IRA, right. So once again, there are large penalties for removing the money from the account before you turn 59 and a half, so make sure that you only put money in there that you can afford to put in there and that you're not going to need immediately. And uh, this is something that's going to reduce your tax bill now so that you can grow your money earlier or, again, have more money at an uh, uh, earlier stage in your life to grow over time. So you might want to be thinking about a traditional IRA, or you might want to be thinking about its brother, the Roth IRA. And the Roth IRA, or the Roth Individual Retirement Account, works a little bit differently. It is a post-tax contribution to your own retirement account. 
Again, held individually through a bank, a broker or bank, and again, limited up to 6,000 a year if you are under 50 or 7,000 a year if you are over 50 as of the year 2020. Again, that, that number will probably increase as uh, we keep moving forward in years here, right? Uh, before anybody uh, uh, asks or is wondering, right, you can only put money in one or the other uh, in terms of that uh, $6,000 limit. So you put $6,000 in a traditional IRA, or you can put $6,000 into a Roth IRA, or you can put, say, maybe $3,000 in both. That $6,000 limit is a limit for both accounts, right? So you can't put $6,000 in one and then $6,000 in the other. The government's not going to let you do that. But here's what makes a Roth IRA different. If you make $60,000 and you put $6,000 into your Roth IRA, right, then you still get taxed as if you make $60,000. In other words, that $6,000 is still taxed now. However, when you take it out, whatever that money has turned into, the government can't touch it, right? So normally you do have to pay uh, um, uh, taxes on any amount of money that your money accumulates. So any rate of return that your money makes, right, you would have to pay taxes on that, right? But again, you can take any money from your Roth IRA out tax-free, right? So again, it's money you can take out without having to pay any taxes on it uh, when you do take it out. Again, as long as you're past that penalty stage, right? So similar to traditional IRA, uh, except that you're taxed now, but not taxed on any money you would draw after you turn 59 and a half, which is that period with which you are allowed to start withdrawing from your retirement accounts, all right? So keep that in mind. Um, the Roth IRA is a post-tax contribution, so you do pay taxes now. You just don't pay taxes when you take it out later, right? A traditional IRA is a pre-tax contribution, whereas you don't pay taxes now, but you do pay taxes when you take it out later. Any other investment fund, you're going to pay taxes. Uh, uh, any other non-IRA uh, uh, or non-401k kind of investment fund, right? You pay taxes on your income now, and then you also pay taxes on the amount of money that that uh, uh, account generates as a rate of return, right? So uh, with the IRAs, you do avoid taxes on one end or the other, right? Outside of retirement funds, uh, you have to pay both the, the initial uh, income tax as well as the tax on your rate of return, All right? So the great thing about the Roth IRA is that it allows your account to grow tax-free, right? So again, whatever money accumulates in that account, whatever rate of return you get, you do not have to pay taxes on it, right? And so that's the nice part about the Roth IRA. Now, I know a lot of people might be wondering, well, what should I go with, traditional or Roth, right? Well, it depends on a couple factors, right? Uh, it depends on, first of all, what tax bracket your income puts you into, right? So if your income puts you in a higher tax bracket now than you expect to be when you retire and start taking money out of these accounts, right, then you might want to go with the traditional IRA. So for those of you who aren't more aware of kind of how our tax uh, structure works, right, we live in a progressive tax system. The more money you make, then the higher the uh, uh, marginal tax rate is on every dollar that you uh, 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 earn in income, right? So if you say make, say, $200,000, then every dollar you earn after that $200,000 is going to be taxed at a higher rate than if you made, say, just $20,000, where every dollar you earn at that $20,000 is taxed at a lower rate, right? And so you keep kind of graduating in tax brackets and have to pay more or a higher marginal uh, uh, income tax rate, right, the richer you are. So if you have a lot of money now, if you're, making, uh, if you're making a lot of money now in terms of having a high income, then that means you're in a very high tax bracket. That's when you want to go with the traditional IRA because you can save your money from that high tax bracket. And then when you retire and your income goes down to zero, your income is just whatever you take out of that traditional IRA that's going to be taxed at a lower rate unless you're taking out huge amounts of money, right? So again, if you're making a lot of money now, traditional IRA might be the way to go. Another reason why you might want to use a traditional IRA is if you think income taxes will decrease in the future. So in other words, if you think taxes are going to be higher now than in the uh, distant future, traditional might be the way to go, All right? Now, if you are like most people watching this presentation, a young high school or college student, who's maybe uh, doing odd jobs or maybe uh, working that for 10 or $15 an hour, right? In which case that uh, you're, you're not in one of those higher tax brackets now, right? You're not making a lot of money that's going to put you into a high tax bracket. Then you probably want to go with a Roth IRA because you're going to have a lot more money to draw upon when you retire than you do right now. So in other words, if you expect to be in a higher tax bracket when you retire than you are right now, in other words, your income is relatively low now, then you probably want to put your money in a Roth IRA. 
If you think income taxes are going to increase in the distant future, that might also be a reason to put your uh, money in a Roth IRA. Right, so if you think that maybe the government's going to decide to increase income taxes, maybe because the government has uh, trillions upon trillions of dollars in debt and needs to pay it off one day, right? then again, you might also want to think about a Roth IRA. Right, so again, uh, which one you go with kind of depends on your personal circumstances and kind of maybe your political predictions or what you think is going to happen in the future. Right, if you want to be safe, you might uh, consider splitting some money into both. Right, again, you have a $6,000 limit if you're under 50, and that $6,000 limit applies to both of these accounts combined. So you can't put 6,000 in one and 6,000 in another. Right, you can do three in one and three in another, or 6,000 in one and zero in another, or uh, mix and match any way you want up to that six grand. All right, some other savings and investment tips that you should know before leaving this presentation is that some people ask the difference between stocks versus bonds. Well, bonds are kind of like an IOU uh, that you uh, pay back to a uh, uh, that a company uh, um, pays you back for, along with some uh, interest in order for the pleasure of them borrowing your money now. Where a stock is more ownership in a company. Uh, with that in mind, bonds tend to be safer, but they tend to have a lower rate of return. Whereas stocks are more risky, but can yield a higher rate of return. So when you are younger, it's always suggested that you go with stocks because as a young individual, you can afford more risk because you have plenty of time to make up any losses before you retire. But as you age, you want to switch over to bonds. So the general formula that a lot of the finance experts recommend is you take 100 as in 100%, subtract from that your age, and that is a percentage of your investment portfolio that should be in stocks. So for example, if you're 20 years old, you might want 80% of your investment portfolio in stocks and the other 20% in maybe less risky assets. Now, if you're, say, 40 years old, then you might want 60% of your investments in stocks and then 40% in, uh, say, less risky assets. Now, with that in mind, this isn't a hard and fast formula in the sense that I wouldn't every year make a 1% adjustment as you age, right? Um, but with that in mind, just it gets across the idea that the older you are, the larger percentage of your investment you want in things like bonds that are less risky and a lower percentage of your investment that you want in things like stocks that are more risky. Having said that, uh, the best way to get a diversified portfolio that mitigates the risk of stocks is through long-term investments in mutual funds. If you get a uh, diverse set of mutual funds and you hold on to those mutual funds for a long period of time, like between 30 and 40 years, Right, and again, you can expect a 7 to 8% average rate of return on those mutual funds at least. And, uh, and in doing so, it's probably a pretty safe investment. So stocks are really only uh, risky, uh, mutual funds are only risky in the short term. In the long term, they're actually quite safe, which is again why you want to go with stocks when you're young and then uh, bonds as you get older, right? So as you get older and closer to retirement, like if you're three or four years away from retirement, you definitely may be switching your portfolio over into uh, less risky investments. Um, having said that, at a young age, right, live dangerously, go with stocks, right? Chances are, again, over a long period of time, it's going to be uh, just, uh, just about as safe and give you a higher rate of return. Right, but what you don't want to do is be that person who has all your money in stocks two years before you retire, and then we hit like a 2008 financial crisis and uh, your portfolio gets wiped out so you don't have anything to retire on, right? So you just want to make sure you avoid being that person. Uh, another thing that you want to do is uh, when you go to invest in mutual funds, there are two different kinds uh, broadly. There are what we call indexed equity mutual funds and then there's what's called managed equity funds. Now both of these are funds that deal with stocks. You also have funds again that deal with bonds that are probably a bit safer. Uh, but the difference between indexed equity and managed funds is that indexed equity funds basically are indexed towards a broad index like the S&P 500 or the Dow Jones, right? It's basically a computer algorithm automatically puts uh, the top 500 stocks into your fund. If a stock drops out of the top 500, the computer algorithm sells it. If a new one comes in, the computer algorithm buys it. So it happens automatically. It doesn't require any research. Whereas a managed equity fund has experts trying to pick winners and losers to decide what's the uh, 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 best fund out there, the one that's going to maximize your rate of return. Now, managed funds tend to be a little bit more expensive. They tend to have higher administrative costs than these indexed equity funds because you are paying these professionals to do all this research and try to pick these winners and losers, right? And so with that in mind, because these managed equity funds are administered by these professionals who research and select stocks, in effort to maximize your return, 
they are going to have higher uh, fees associated with them, whereas these index equity funds just reflect the holdings of broad indexes, such as, again, the Dow Jones or the S&P 500, they're going to have lower fees associated with them. Right. The reason why you might want to consider going with index funds over managed funds is because, generally speaking, over a long period of time, so again, over a 20 or 30 year period, index funds perform at least as well as managed funds. And again, they're cheaper, so you have more of your money working for you versus paying these administrative fees. Now, it's certainly possible that you could pick managed funds that outperform the index equity funds. It's also certainly possible that you could pick managed funds that uh, do not outperform the index equity funds, right? Again, in general, the index equity funds over a long period of time do about as well, or at least as well as these managed equity funds. You have more of your money working for you, so you might want to consider going with these indexed equity funds. All right, having said that, some people will certainly try to sell you on these managed funds, saying, look how great our funds did, look how they outperformed the S&P 500 over the last five years. That doesn't mean necessarily, though, that they're going to outperform them over the next five years, right? Generally speaking, it's hard for people to... Uh, 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 beat the, stock, beat the uh, stock market over a long period of time. They might be able to beat it for a short period of time, but beating it over a long period of time is much more difficult. Right? So again, index equity funds puts more of your money to work for you and usually has about as high a rate of return. So you might want to consider going with those. That's what I would invest in for your retirement accounts. Right? Some other savings and investment tips is number three, make sure you avoid credit card debt at all costs. I'm not saying that you shouldn't necessarily get a credit card, right? Credit cards can be a pretty valuable tool. You can get things like Sky Miles and cash back, right? But you want to pay your credit card at the end of the month, every month in full. You don't want to leave any unpaid credit card balances at the end of the month because you're going to have to pay interest on those. And the interest rate that you have to pay on your credit cards are far higher than the interest rate that you would have to pay on your um or the interest rate that you'd expect to receive on your investments, right? So again, you might get 78% investing in one of these mutual funds, right? But you're probably going to have to pay anywhere between 18 and 30% on your credit card debt, right? So you don't want to leave any unpaid balances on your credit cards, right? So if you do choose to use a credit card, make sure you pay it off in full at the end of the month, every month. Again, do not leave any unpaid balances at the end of the credit card and whatever, at the end of the month, I'm sorry. And whatever you do, do not just make the minimum payment on the credit card. In other words, don't just pay the very smallest amount that you're allowed to pay and leave those unpaid balances because, again, that's going to rack up that huge interest, and that compound interest can cut both ways. It can work against you if you are the person who is paying it. All right. So, again, any interest rate you pay on your unpaid credit card balances is going to be far higher than any rate of return you can expect to see on your investments. So make sure you pay those cards off in full at the end of the month, every month. I always say use your credit card like you'd use your debit card or like you'd use your uh, checking account, right? Don't put anything on your credit card that you're not going to be able to pay off at the end of the month, right? Now, one of the arguments against using a credit card is that a lot of people, uh, they, um, they don't really track their spending on credit cards as well as when they use cash. In other words, when you go to check out and you use cash, right, you know exactly how much you're paying because you have to fork over that amount of money. But when you go to check out the grocery store using a credit card, you just shove your card in the slot, you pull it right back out, you don't even look at what the total is. And that can cause you to spend a lot more when you use credit cards than when you use cash. So if you're the kind of person who can't keep track of your spending, then again, credit cards might not be for you, even if you do pay them off at the end of the month every month, simply because uh, you might be spending a lot more than you otherwise would. But if you're somebody who does a good job of keeping track of your spending, right, then again, you can, credit cards can be a great tool. Right? Just make sure you keep track of what you're spending and make sure you pay them off at the end of the month. Right? Again, you can get that cash back with the Sky Miles, which can help you save money down the road. Right? So one more thing that I suggest is keep track of your credit card sp spending by never leaving the store without knowing how much you spent. And by entering the amounts that you spent into a budget spreadsheet like the one I provided for you in that zero-based budgeting assignment, right? So in other words, always know what you're putting on your credit cards, right? Uh, otherwise, again, you might end up spending more than you uh, initially set out to or more than you want. And then finally, remember that your time is valuable. Don't waste it. There's always an opportunity cost to your time, right? In other words, the hour that you spend listening to this presentation is an hour that you did not spend making money, and that's uh, uh, an hour that you did not spend working that you could have increased your paycheck, right? and that's something worth considering, right? 
Now, hopefully that this presentation was worth it and that it sets you up with some tools for the future that you can use to uh, 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 make this uh, presentation, uh, again, uh, a better investment or outpace whatever you would have earned uh, with the hour that you spent listening to it, right? But keep in mind that every minute you spend binge watching Netflix is a minute that you're not spending possibly earning, learning, and growing, right? It is really important to invest and invest early. The earlier you start investing, then the more that's going to compound and the more you're going to have uh, uh, to retire on later, right? The more likely you're going to reach that millionaire status and the sooner you're going to do it as well. Right. So again, if you're thinking about maybe uh, as the uh, Netflix uh, uh, is counting down the next uh, between the now and the start of the next episode, right, you might think, eh, I could spend an hour watching that next episode or I could maybe spend an hour doing, say, some kind of work. Again, maybe it's just walking dogs. Maybe it's driving for Uber. Maybe it is um, working an extra hour at your company. Right. Uh, and then taking that money and putting in that investment account. Right. Uh, I'm almost certain that you're going to be much more happy if you spent that hour making money versus if you spent that hour watching Netflix. Right. Again, sometimes binge watching Netflix is a perfectly acceptable thing to do. Right. Sometimes you need that break. But just remember that it's not free. Right. To binge watch that extra episode, even if it's not going to cost you any more than your five or six dollar Netflix subscription. Right. But it's uh, definitely going to cost you in terms of the opportunity cost of that time. And your time is your most valuable asset. Don't waste it. All right. So if you're interested in the stuff, right, here's a, again another link to that compound interest calculator in case you missed it throughout the lecture, right? If you're kind of uh, interested in seeing what kind of fields are going to be paying more, what the outlooks look like in those fields, you might want to take a look at the Occupational Outlook Handbook. I provided that there for you. There's actually a great series of videos called the Minority Mindset videos on YouTube that go over a lot of uh, not only this information, but additional information that I didn't have time to cover. But it's basically talking about how to start out with zero and then uh, create wealth uh, through different uh, avenues like the ones we talked about, plus some additional ones as well. Uh, I've watched a lot of those videos. I haven't seen them all. Uh, just about all the ones I've watched have been pretty informative. I would definitely recommend checking those out. Um, if you want an entertaining example of what not to do, then you might want to check out ESPN's 30 for 30, Broke. It talks about how athletes who make millions upon millions of dollars throughout their athletic career end up filing for bankruptcy or have zero to show for it because of poor investment choices or decisions about what they had to do with their money that they made uh, throughout their uh, tenure there as an athlete, right? Um, if they had just followed uh, some of the things in this video, like getting some boring indexed equity mutual funds, then they'd be set for life after just a couple years of competing at the professional level. Right. Instead, again, they find themselves broke and without any money uh, ha after having earned uh, millions upon millions throughout their career. Right. So that is it. I uh, hope you get and stay wealthy. That is my number one goal for you using these uh, resources. Right. If you have any questions at all about anything, please feel free to email me at joab.corey at ucr.edu. And I'll be happy to help you with any questions that you may have, at least to the extent of my abilities. Uh, if I can't help you, I'll try to point you in the right direction. I hope you found this presentation useful. And again, hopefully you can start using it to uh, uh, create and engineer your wealth so that you can uh, accomplish all your personal and professional goals in life. All right. Again, thank you for your attention. And just let me know if you ever need anything. Take care.